LP. <laughs> yes, uh, my name is Louis Philippe uh, LP. Uh, um, the person who did most of his work, Amir, was not able to come here uh, because of the travel ban, but I'm really happy to present. Um, so I will talk today and I, about tensor fusion, but I personally believe that we are in a very very exciting time for AI. Uh, I think we see it in the news everywhere. Uh, new technologies for assistant, uh, assistive technologies, robotic technologies. We even uh, have a lot of work these days. It's, it's kind of part of our everyday work. Let's Skype. We're going to Skype. We'll, uh, and a lot of students, my students included, watch YouTube, but my students watch YouTube for work. At least that's what they tell me because we're studying uh, the YouTube content for multimodal uh, sentiment in it. So, uh, and so as we're building all these new technologies, we're trying to make them more human-like or at least try to improve the way we communicate with these technologies. And it's good to study how human communication is happening and so that we better understand how we're building these technologies. So as humans are this talking to each other, there's differently a strong aspect of it, which is the verbal component. Uh, the verbal component is the choice of the words you're making, the way you're phrasing things, but also the intent you're putting behind these spoken words. Uh, another aspect of it, which is the vocal aspect, is the same word, like yeah, 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 yeah can have very different meaning depending on its prosody. And that's one of the aspects. There's also vocal expression, uh, like a laughter. And I have a background in computer vision. Trevor Darrell was a long time ago my advisor. So I did put a full column also on visual. Uh, and I think this is maybe also informative for this audience. Uh, there's a lot of it is through the gesture. There's my B gesture. Uh, there's the gaze gesture. I'm a speaker. I wanted to look at left and right. There's also proximix. I will not do it right now, but there is a certain distance that's acceptable. And that's uh, different often for different culture. Uh, there is also facial expression. A lot of the work is on how we build, uh, express our emotions. Uh, so as we want to create these technology that are able to perceive our sentiment or emotion or even uh, our social behavior. Social behavior means that there's more than one person involved. And so empathy, engagement, and dominance are some of these examples. So we want to do take advantage of what has been spoken and understand the vehicle and the visual and fuse that to infer this. Uh, and so we are, as a first test bed, using a lot of the interesting work that's uh, the data that's online on YouTube. Uh, let me play a quick clip. Let's see how the audio goes. The post office drives me insane. Just, oh, just, this is why. Okay, what do you think? Does he love post office? Does he hate post office? It's really interesting. Uh, if you want to know the rest of this talk, it's very, and uh, th this video is really interesting. The, the, the reason why he hates post office is very interesting. It's not politically correct, so I can't give it on the camera right now. Uh, but what's really interesting is do you naturally got, in fact, uh, if, I, if I've uh, shown this in a different language, you would have probably also understood that he hated or did not like, there was a negative emotion. Uh, expressed there. Um, so we built uh, a data set. We call it the CMU MOSI data set. It's publicly available. Um, it looks small uh, because it's 93 videos, but it's a total of 2,200 uh, odd, uh, segments. Segments are uh, subjective segments. So given these videos, which are on average uh, maybe a minute or two, we do uh, subjectivity segmentation. And from the subjective segment, go ahead and do annotation with Mechanical Turk. Um, and the one thing that's really important when we look at all these data sets is Krippendorf Alpha, or Copen, uh, will, uh, Cohen Kappa will be another one, is the agreement between the coders. And that is one of the highest uh, that I've seen in any data set, multimodal data set for emotion recognition. Uh, and that's really important because that means that humans are agreeing with each other when doing this task. So let's 
try to have computers also doing the same task. So if I uh, look at this also just to give you some statistics, highly negative, negative, weakly negative, neutral. And so we see a relatively uh, uh, broad uh, or almost constant distribution. This was also partially uh, by design uh, on the way the videos were selected to have that uh, so that we can work with a relatively small data set. And so if I ask you, as all of you do deep learning, and I ask you, okay, how can we build a multimodal uh, model for this? Uh, and you look at all the current literature, uh, you will probably start doing what's called a joint representation. Joint representation is the obvious way of taking the information from the text. So what has been said, it could be transcribed or, or ASR as we've seen in the previous one. Uh, all of the series of images and from the audio, how you fuse that. You can learn this joint representation. It is uh, at that point becomes a nonlinear mapping between each of these individual representation. This is also what is similar to early fusion, but human are not uh, more complex than this. When they express things, it often has this very strong nonlinearity that if you have infinite amount of data, maybe you can pick up with this simple model. But let's look at how humans are doing things. If I look at a simple uh, unimodal cues, like this movie is sick. And that may be more of an American thing, uh, but if I look at this, this movie is sick. Uh, it could be uh, sick because it's bad. It's sick, it's bad, it's negative. Or in the US and probably another country, it can also mean very positive thing. So just by itself, language can be ambiguous. If I say the movie is fair, the movie is fair, it's probably neutral or positive. That's the kind of uh, inference you will get. And if you just see someone smiling by itself, you probably also think it's a positive. And if someone is loud, loud can be quite ambiguous. You can be loud because you're excited or loud because you hate that movie. So some audio and visual and text can be ambiguous. So it's interesting to look at bimodal interaction. So if I look at this movie is sick, and the person is smiling, there's a high likelihood that this person is expressing a positive uh, sentiment. The same way, if the movie is sick and a frown, then it's more likely a negative uh, sentiment. Another example is the movie is sick and loud. Is it positive or negative? It is still quite ambiguous. Uh, at that point, we're still in ambiguity. So let's look at Trimodal interaction. Trimodal interaction start being interesting. This movie is sick, a smile and a loud. Oh my God, this is probably a very, very good, very strong positive. But here's the interesting thing. If I say this movie is fair, it is a strong linguistic cue that seems to override the other um, nonverbal, and often this will be labeled more as a uh, weakly positive because the language takes over in this case. So it's not always a, a, a simple interaction, and that's why it is important to model unimodal, bimodal, and trimodal. So now let's revisit the same kind of architecture. I'm putting two uh, modalities just to start with. And so we want to be able to model a model that learns this unimodal and bimodal interaction explicitly in our intermediate multimodal representation. And here's how we solve it. It is, is by building this uh, representation, which uh, look at the concatenation. This is uh, uh, the cross product, the, the product uh, between the X, HX, which is your representation from the text, and HY, your representation from the Y. But the trick here is you add this little one. And that looks really simple, but this does beautiful things for you. What does it do? It automatically ends up also creating this beautiful tensor that has both the unimodal representation and the bimodal representation or interaction inside it. So one simple trick like this can bring you a representation that is both uh, bringing up front unimodal and bimodal interaction. And you're like, hey, there's a third modality. Yes, let's look at the Trime version. Uh, the student had a lot of fun doing that picture. It took us a lot version. But what you see here is, is great. What you have here is uh, you have the unimodal uh, represent, uh, interactions. You have the bimodal interaction. 
And then you have the trimodal interaction, all in the same tensor. So from your audio, text, image, and video, you end up having this tensor representation, and that's where the name Tensor Fusion Network, because it brings all three interactions together. And so now, how do you do this for sentiment analysis? Most of this will stay the same, and the question I will show now is, how do you represent the text, image, and uh, audio uh, for, e for sentiment analysis? Uh, there was a great uh, discussion earlier about LSTM for audio being challenging, and so you will see how we end up uh, simplifying it in our case. But the first one is, how do we do it for spoken language? Uh, language. So in our case, we have uh, uh, not just uh, written text, but this is, these are transcription. And as we know very much, written text and spoken text can be different. This representation is a simple one, as you probably expect. A love representation, a word embedding, LSTM. And then uh, we do a dimensionality reduction. So this is just one uh, embedding. The embedding for the acoustic follows a little bit of the same thing, So, but instead Instead of an LSTM, we use a mean pooling. And the reason for that is LSTM does not bring advantages in our experiment, at least empirically. So here what you have is for anybody in speech, they recognize all of these features. These are classical features in speech. Uh, MFCC is probably the most popular. The reason we also put these is we strongly believe that it's not just about the, uh, the prosody, uh, but also the voice quality. And that's one of the things you get here looking at the low total flow uh, features. And then you have, uh, again, dimensionality reduction. For images, we also look at this uh, at a slightly higher representation of just pixels uh, using state-of-the-art algorithms that are already available. If you want one of these, you can Google OpenFace uh, CMU, and you will get uh, 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 software for that that gives you how the change in the muscle in the face. Because if you use uh, ImageNet on this, uh, like a simple CNN uh, train on ImageNet. What will this uh, give you? It will tell you there's a face. Next frame, oh, there's another face. Oh, there's another face. Really what you say tell you is that there are faces the whole way. Uh, so it, it's not as useful. So it's good to look a little bit of step ahead, a little bit further. And then we do, again, the, ma the mean pooling. LSTM does not improve in this case. And then we do a lower uh, dimensionality reduction. This is uh, everything put together. The really, the core is here, the tensor fusion. And the tensor fusion uh, brings together the language, the acoustic, and the visual. And then we have, at the end, a simple layer to do the prediction. So uh, our experiments, we did, as I mentioned, on the CMU data set. And we followed a lot of the protocol uh, from previous work in sentiment analysis, uh, one of the landmark uh, paper by uh, Richard Sacher, where we have positive and negative. We have five classes. So it's a simple uh, resampling of the seven classes to five classes. And then we also have the regression. Uh, in all of these, the, the only change is the loss function. Uh, everything else is exactly the same. The only change is the loss function. And here are the state of the art up to now for each of these uh, tasks. Uh, there is the convolutional multicurrental learning, which mostly uh, looks at uh, images in a CNN representation and use the interesting trick. Uh, I know these days you're like, hey, is it, it's not deep learning. Uh, but uh, yeah, a support vector machine extension uh, to multiple kernel is called MKL. And what it is interesting about it is each kernel, one, one kernel for each modality, gives you this similarity function different for each modality. Uh, the selective additi additive uh, learning model looks at trying to uh, recognize, uh, be taking into consideration uh, that if the sentiment is expressed by the same person, you may have some identity specific information. And then SVM, uh, and oh, by the way, the reason now we're putting random forest uh, in all of our data sets uh, is the following is we got rejected from ACL for not having random forest in this. So we learn put random forest 
progress in your uh, paper. That is really important. And we put it now in all of them. Uh, so really interesting results. So for this multimodal, uh, we get an improvement uh, over state of the art, uh, a significant improvement over state of the art. This is both for binary uh, five class and for regression. This is accuracy F1. And we have uh, mean, er um, mean error and uh, correlation. Uh, and it's uh, good to see what we're not done yet because this is human performance. Human performance is looking at how much the uh, human coder agree with each other. And finally, this is a delta SOT uh, uh, state of the art, how much we improve. Uh, it is very important when you look at this to understand why we got this improvement of our state of the art. Uh, so we looked at in unimodal, this is unimodal, we're taking the model but taking away uh, some of the modalities. We see, great, language, not surprising, being the most important. This is using just bimodal, just trimodal, using bimodal and unimodal, and finally using them. And this is using just a simple uh, feed forward that I presented earlier. Uh, what's also interesting is to look at each of these individual ones, like in this case the language one, compared with the current state of the art. And the reason we are uh, state of the art on this data set is because it is spoken language. And a lot of these are in fact trained on, uh, were trained uh, like this uh, uh, research structured paper was trained on a large, very large corpus, but uh, trained on a different data set. Uh, the uh, ad, um, average network, deep average network, this is trained on texts, uh, written text, and then when we retrain it on spoken text, uh, we get the improvement, and we see again for a few others of these uh, benchmarks. I, I like to show, you're probably not as interested, but visual modalities as well. Uh, we do also state of the art for visual modality, even with 3D CNN or every uh, uh, variation you can think of, and even for audio, we also state of the art for this very simple model to not to performing very well. The last thing I want to show you is some examples, and that's the last slide I have here before the summary. Uh, so here's, here's an example. You can't even tell funny jokes, uh, and then you have a frowning. You can't tell even funny joke, can't tell you something negative, but may get a little bit confused with funny joke. So the language gets, so this is just acoustic, just visual, just language, and this is uh, our fusion, and this is the ground truth. Sorry if you can't see. But the frowning clearly comes as a negative and makes the fusion together. I, I gave it a B. This is language only, but because of the smile and excited, it increases. And, but I must say, those are some pretty big shoes to fill, so I thought maybe it has a chance. But then you have a strong head shake, which brings it as very negative, so at the end, it's not as positive as it could have been. And this is another example where the low energy in the frown makes it much lower. So in summary, uh, just before, uh, I just forgot I had this. Uh, if you are interested in multimodal and you have, uh, want to have some really bedside uh, reading for you, there is this 24-page uh, survey paper on multimodal machine learning. Uh, this is uh, easy to find on Google, Google Multimodal Machine Learning. It was just released three, day, uh, three months ago uh, talking about the different challenge of multimodal. So thank you very much for your attention. What we present today is uh, unimodal, bimodal, and trimodal interaction learn uh, into the tensor fusion network and then a uh, new uh, CMU MOSI data set. Uh, merci beaucoup for your attention. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Hi there. Uh, I have a question because you showed that the fusion, the tensor fusion was like a big important thing. And in the end, you compared the results that you obtained with that with other models, which are like not totally related. Did you compare also when you have like just simple concatenation to your fusion? And what are the differences in results? Yeah, that was uh, early. We call it early fusion. Um, do you want me to go back? Uh, I can go back to that slide. But it was the early fusion. Yeah, that's the first thing you try uh, yeah. is the early fusion. Oh, sorry, I uh, that. Yes, yeah, 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 yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, cool talk. Now, 
in your model, which is very appealing, you, you have all these private spaces for the modalities and you have the air interactions. Is there also a potential regularization effect from actually sharing parameters between the different modalities? And is there an, uh, I missed one like word. Okay. You could also share a bunch of parameters between the different modalities mm -hmm. and get regularization that way. Is that something you tried out? Uh, and would you expect there to be an effect? Um, uh, by, uh, if, uh, you, the, the word you said is regularization. Yeah, okay, looking at regularization, but, uh, yeah. Um, we, th we also exploring, uh, instead of, once you've done that joint representation, which was discussed, you can uh, add on top of it, if it's what you're describing, some regularization to infer a uh, joint. Um, the other way you could do is what's called coordinated representation, when you do multimodal, and one of the is deep CCA. Uh, what it is, is you're learning individual representation, but then you're regularizing them in a sense, but you're inferring them um, uh, by using this uh, coordination, uh, this uh, correlation between modalities. Um, I think this, if I understood, if not, I would be happy to discuss uh, offline, but we also explore some of these as well. So uh, I had a, a similar yeah. question. Uh, you combine all of these things sort of asynchronously, uh, but they are synchronous, right? So yeah. you could, had you thought about combining them into one model that sort of has that synchronicity between the modalities? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you're a reviewer for AAAI, you may see that paper, uh, or uh, two papers. Uh, but yeah, we're really interested in that. What's really interesting when you start looking at this is what is the granularity you will pick? Uh, and we explore different versions of that, and the one that seems the most intuitive also at the same time is at the word level. Um, so we do look at it, and we, uh, once it's synchronized, we do at the word level, um, and then uh, what's uh, important is how do you look at uh, uh, these temporal patterns. And yes, you could be a believer of LSTM and hope LSTM will learn it from you. But as we know really well, uh, it will probably not. And so we looked at uh, attention models that over these uh, longer ones. And so there's some very interesting work done in that direction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and there was someone in the back also. Okay. Hi, uh, very nice talk, thank you. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so you have this multimodal and you're applying it on a unidimensional, like if I take the Russell valence space, you're applying on, on along the valence axis. So have you tried applying on like uh, on both axes, for example, on the negative sentiment, uh, will, you, will you be able to differentiate between like, anger and frustration, or mm -hmm. anger and annoyance? Yes, yes, very much. Um, so right now, this was only sentiment, and we extended it in our latest work on emotion recognition, both in a discrete label a sense, um, the six or seven usual one, but also in the continuous uh, arousal balance. Uh, it generalizes uh, to that. Uh, we also started looking at speaker tray, uh, confidence. Uh, persuasion, uh, a lot of these other traits uh, that uh, may not change very much. So what's interesting with sentiment and emotion is there are a state. A state changes more over time. A trait is something that usually, ch uh, ch if it changes, it's over a much longer period of time. And so we also look at this uh, over a longer period of time. So that's an, an answering two questions. It's just not short-term prediction, but we also started extending. Long period of time is only a few minutes uh, up to now, uh, eventually we'll look at uh, hours, but for now it's only a few minutes. Uh, but yeah, we've seen uh, extension, uh, but as we also see, is temporal information becomes even more important in these cases. So for arousal, we, we see importance of the uh, temporal in these cases. Uh, thanks for your talk. So um, when you showed the data set, you said you had around 0.77 inter-annotator agreement for the sentiment stuff. But then in the end, in the evalu evaluation, you had a human baseline of around 85% accuracy. How do you explain kind of this yeah. huge difference? Oh, so a great question. So Kruppendorf Alpha, um, what it does is uh, if you were to compute agreement, just simple agreement uh, between the coders, what you get is 84 uh, what uh, Krippendorf as Cohen Kappa does is that it's, it, it divides this by how likely it is just by chance. 
uh, you would uh, you would get this agreement, and that's why it's lower, and that's important. Uh, you, you because if all, of, for example, all of your data was extremely biased, uh, your coin, uh, your agreement can be really high, uh, but then uh, coin kappa will be much lower. So that's the difference between the two. Yeah. Um, hi, great talk. Uh, hi. I have a question about. Uh, so, if I understand correctly, using humans in the video and their facial expressions to get the sentiment. But there could be some videos where you don't have the human, maybe he's filming a situation, but there's audio and there's visual. So you get this, can you get the sentiment from the seeing? So what's happening in the image? Uh, mm. Is that feasible or how difficult is it is? Very company? interesting. Yes, um, right now, definitely our work is our in Sorry, oriented towards the speaker, and that was by design. This, uh, there's very interesting work uh, on video summarization, video description, uh, and you can see if it's not happened yet that really soon there will be video description with sentiment uh, happening. We're interested in that. I will not tell more on the camera right now, but I'm happy to talk uh, off camera uh, about this. But this is very interesting line of direction. Uh, you will have to think differently about it. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of interesting things there, yes. Okay, great. Let's thank the speaker again.